also expressed that they look forward to seeing each other later this year at UNGA and, these, uh, and, and to continue these important conversations with allies. Lastly, on behalf of our entire administration, I want to extend prayers to the family, friends, and loved ones of Molly Tibbetts. The nation has watched for over 30 days as local, state, and federal officials have searched for Molly, a rising sophomore at the University of Iowa. Sadly, the individual believed to be responsible for the murder is an illegal immigrant, making this an unfortunate reminder of why we need to strengthen our immigration laws. The Bible tells us in Psalms that the Lord heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. The Tibbetts family is hurting, and they're on the hearts of all Americans, and we are grieving with them. With that, I'll take your questions. Yeah. Cecilia. Thank you, Sarah. Michael Cohen under oath pleaded guilty to, among things, paying Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal during the campaign. And he says he did it at the direction of the President of the United States. Did President Trump commit a crime? Uh, as the president has said, we've stated many times he did nothing wrong. There are no charges against him, um, and we've commented on this extensively. Then why not report these payments? Uh, again, uh, I'm not going to get into the back and forth details. I can tell you, as the president has stated on numerous occasions, he did nothing wrong. There are no charges against him in this. Uh, and just because Michael Cohen uh, made a plea deal doesn't mean that that implicates the president on anything. Can you stand John? here today and say the president has never lied to the American people? Because so many people now look back at that tape of him on Air Force One saying he knew nothing about these payments. When in fact we now know he knew everything about these payments. So has he lied? Look, again, I think that's an, a ridiculous accusation. The president in this matter has done nothing wrong and there are no charges against him. John? Uh, the president said to Fox News in an interview with Anthony Earhart this morning that this could not have been an illegal campaign contribution because he <clears throat> paid the money. He put more than $60 million of his own money into the campaign. So. How do you draw the line between, I mean, maybe this didn't flow through the campaign, but how do you draw the line between what was a campaign contribution and what might have been a payment to somebody for other purposes? Look, I'm not going to get into the back and forth of the legal part of this. Um, I would refer you to the president's outside counsel on that. As I told Cecilia, what I can tell you is what the president has stated a number of times. He did nothing wrong. There are no charges against him. Just because Michael Cohen has made a deal doesn't mean anything with regards to the president. Stephen. Sarah, the president tweeted this morning in frustration that Michael Cohen wrote. Perhaps you can shed a little bit more light on that because the implication is that, the, that, that Michael Cohen gave up something that the president would rather stay secret. Is, is that what we should read into this, or is there the, another? The president has expressed his views on that. I don't have anything further to add. Can I ask one other question? Is the president now planning on or intent on pardoning Paul Mann? Uh, the Manafort case doesn't have anything to do with the president. Doesn't have anything to do with his campaign. It doesn't have anything to do with the White House. Margaret. Sarah. Um, I actually was going to ask about Manafort, but let me ask in a slightly different way. Even if it has nothing to do with the president, he still could have the power to uh, pardon Mr. Manafort. Is that something that he's begun discussing with the team? Has he ruled it out? Does it come up? And the I'm not aware of any conversations regarding that at all. Thanks. Uh, the question that I also other have than asked, actually when he was asked by um, a news outlet earlier this week, and he said uh, that he hadn't been thinking about that at all. Thanks. Um, the. Uh, in, in times like this, not that there are that many times like this, uh, White House is often trying to figure out uh, whether there need to be any internal adjustments to deal with some of the political issues you're going to have now with the Hill, with voters, with uh, internally with lawmakers. Are, is the White House making any adjustments in terms of responsibilities of chiefs of staff, uh, communications to donors, communications to supporters, uh, how, you will, how you intend to kind of respond both protectively and offensively to the, the crisis that you're now in? Uh, I, I wouldn't view it that way um, at all and um, would disagree with the premise of your question. Uh, the White House is focused on the same things uh, that we were focused on the first day that we got here, and that is growing the economy, which is doing extremely well, protecting our borders, strengthening the safety and security of all Americans. Uh, those are the things that we're focused on that day one, January 20th, and those are the same things that we're focused on right now. Jake. Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, first, I'd like to start off by congratulating you. This is your 100th briefing, and there's no way this, what you do every day is easy. 
Um, I've got two real quick questions. First of all, our colleague Jonathan Swan over at Axios recently wrote, and I quote, several top Republican operatives working on the midterm elections told me Trump's fanciful red wave predictions could depress Republican turnout and ironically serve to make any blue wave even bigger. So are you familiar with any Republican operatives who would concur with this statement? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I think that the thing that's going to encourage people is the lack of a message by Democrats. Uh, they have nothing to run on other than attacking this president. And not only does the president and the record that Republicans have had over the last year and a half under his leadership is a great one to run on. We have an incredible story to tell. The economy is booming. Uh, record numbers just today. We're going to continue focusing on the things that Americans care about. And I think that'll be uh, certainly what encourages them and certainly what will help push uh, Republicans to do well in November. Uh, and yesterday, yesterday, the president stated that, quote, Israel will pay a price for the Jerusalem embassy move. Not sure if that's an exact quote, though. Should Israel be concerned that the price they may have to pay would be one that they're not prepared or willing to pay at this point? Uh, we think that the president's decision was the right one uh, to move the embassy, uh, something that other presidents had promised and failed to do. And this is a president who's been delivering on the promises that he's made. Sorry. What price are we talking about? What price might Israel have to pay? Uh, I don't have anything further for you, uh, John. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Since uh, those guilty verdicts yesterday in the Paul Manafort trial, the president has said some kind things about Mr. Manafort. He's called him a good man, a good person. He said he feels badly for what has happened to him. He tweeted today, unlike Michael Cohen, he refused to break, make up stories in order to get a deal. He tweeted, such respect for a brave man. Is Mr. Manafort a simple candidate for a presidential pardon? Uh, once again, that's not something that has been up for discussion. I don't have anything for you. Let me ask you about the Kavanaugh nomination. There's some Democrats uh, that are saying that the nomination should be put on hold uh, because of the legal developments yesterday. Uh, Hawaiian <coughs> Senator Maisie Hirono uh, put out a statement. She said this president, who is an unindicted co-conspirator in a criminal matter, does not deserve the courtesy of a meeting with his nominee. What is uh, your reaction to that, Sarah? Uh, this is a desperate and pathetic attempt by Democrats to obstruct a very highly qualified nominee. Uh, the hearing date has been set for September 4th, and Judge Kavanaugh will be there. Steve? Yes, Sarah. Uh, trade talks between the United States and China are resuming. The president earlier this week expressed quite low expectations for those talks. I'm wondering if that has changed in what you would like to see come out of uh, these discussions? We're, we're, as you said, these conversations are continuing. Uh, I don't have any announcements on them. They're ongoing. Certainly what we'd like to see is better trade deals for the United States. Uh, the president wants to see free, fair, and more reciprocal trade between other countries, particularly with China, and we're going to continue in those conversations. Sarah, yeah. Yeah. Sarah, does the president feel betrayed by Michael Cohen, and is he concerned about what he might say to Robert Mueller? Uh, I don't think the president's concerned at all. He knows uh, that he did nothing wrong and that there was no collusion, and we're going to continue uh, focusing on the things that uh, Americans care about and that we can have an impact and on. And one more question on trade. Uh, do you anticipate a deal between Mexico and the United States on NAFTA this week? Uh, I'm not going to get ahead of any potential announcement. Uh, for decades, NAFTA has harmed American workers and cost the U.S. billions of dollars. We're focused on making sure we deal with the new address those problems, and we'll let you know when we have an announcement. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. In his interview today, the president said he found out about those payments that Michael Cohen made later on, but he's on tape discussing how to make one of the payments with Michael Cohen, so before the payment was made. So how do you explain that? Once again, I've commented on this pretty extensively. Um, what I can tell you about this is that the president did nothing wrong. There are no charges against him. There is no collusion for anything beyond that. I would refer you to the president's outside counsel. Rudy yeah. 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 Giuliani is not a taxpayer-funded spokesperson for the president. You are. So how can I'm you not explain that. something the president said today on the grounds of the White House that seems to contradict an audio that has been confirmed that it is of the president saying that? Once again, um, I have addressed this a number of times just because you continue to ask the same questions over and over. I'm not going to give you a different answer. The president has done nothing wrong. There are no charges against him. There is no collusion. That's what I can tell you about this. If you want something further, I would refer you to the president's outside counsel. Does the White Julie, House maintain, oh, sorry, I call the president, I'll come the back House to you, maintain the president did not have affairs with Karen McDougal or Stephanie Clifford? We've addressed this a number of times. Francesca, go ahead. Thanks, Sarah. Two questions. First, 
you said that there have been no discussions about a uh, potential pardon for Paul Manafort. So you're not ruling it out entirely. I mean, if there's no discussions about it right at this point, the president hasn't said he won't do it. It's possible that there could be a pardon for him in the future. Is that the, correct? The, ol the only comment that the president has made uh, on this was when he was asked by a news outlet earlier this week, and he said, no, he was not considering that. Well, Beyond that, that the there have been that no other discussions. Before, that was before Paul Manafort uh, was convicted on eight of the 18 counts at the time when the president was asked that. So I'm asking now, if, now that he's been convicted on those counts. And I'm answering you now that there have been no discussions at the White House on that matter. Right, okay, on a, on, a, on a different point. Last time that we were in here, you read off some ex-officials and one current official who the president was considering taking away their security clearance. I wanted to follow up on that and ask you, who was, first of all, who was conducting that review to determine whether or not those security clearances will be pulled? <clears throat> and second of all, I wanted to ask you about a tweet that the president said saying that he thought that potentially James Clapper is being nice to him so that he doesn't lose his security clearance. Is that a threat that if James Clapper isn't nice to him, that he'll lose his security clearance? No, I don't have any other announcements on that front. We're continuing to review. When we have an announcement, I'll let you know. Sarah. Sarah. Sorry, Julie, go ahead. I'm sorry? Who's doing the review? That was uh, a number question. of people involved here at the White House. <laughs> Julie, go ahead. Sarah, in his tweet about Paul Manafort this morning, the president seemed to be praising him for essentially refusing to cooperate with federal prosecutors in a way that could implicate him, the president. Um, is that what he meant to suggest? And does not that seem to indicate that he thinks that loyalty to him personally is more important with abiding by the law or cooperating with this government in a, an investigation? Not at all. The Manafort case doesn't involve the president, doesn't involve his campaign, and has nothing to do with the White House. The president has expressed his views. Sarah, Sarah. Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. The, Michael Cohen's lawyer has suggested publicly that there is new evidence that they would like to present about foreknowledge of election hacking. So does the president, does the White House maintain there was no foreknowledge of any election hacking during the 2016 campaign. Uh, I'm not aware of anything, no. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah two questions as well for you. Um, given that five convicted felons are now linked to the president or his campaign, and given that the president promised to hire the best people, did he fail to live up to that promise? Look, the president has uh, employed thousands of people in his lifetime uh, and had incredible successes both in business and in uh, the public service. Uh, he's the president of the United States. I think he's doing quite well. Thank and you. can I just follow up uh, my second question, Sarah, just follow up on Cecilia, because I I understand that you don't want to answer the same question a million times, and you've said the president did nothing illegal, but I didn't hear a response to the question. Did he lie to the American people when he talked about this on Air Force One? No, and the president's addressed this a number of times. Sarah, thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, president Trump says he feels badly for Cohen and Manafort. One of the men pleaded guilty to crimes. The other was found guilty of crimes, including tax fraud, which robbed the American public of tax dollars they were owed. Why does he feel bad for either of these men? Uh, once again, the president has expressed his views on this matter, and I have nothing else to add on that. Just to follow up on that, does he believe that there's an intrinsic problem with the Justice Department, or does he only believe if someone who is close to him uh, is a victim? of the Justice Department. Yeah, I think we've certainly seen uh, a lot of concerns come out of some of the activities uh, of people that worked at the Department of Justice, whether it's uh, Peter Strzok or Lisa Page or James Comey. Uh, we've walked through those a number of times, and certainly I think it's given cause for a lot of Americans, some of the activities those individuals yeah, engaged in. The, the, the question uh, is, uh, someone uh, who's uh, close to him, the president paints them as a victim, as if his own Justice Department is not doing its job. Uh, again, certainly the president has expressed his views on this matter, um, and he's raised concerns about a number of other problems that he's seen within the Department of Justice. Hunter. You, I, I wanted to follow up about the earlier question about the president's comments on Fox News with regard to the payments to Ms. Daniels and Ms. McDougal. Um, when exactly did he learn about them? And also, are there any other payments he has now become aware of? Or are those the only two women who have received money for agreeing not to repeat their stories of alleged affairs with the president? Once again, I've, ad I've addressed all that I'm going to say on the, the Cohen issue. The for those specific questions with more details, I would refer you to the president's outside counsel. If we're going to such crucial matters to the outside counsel, can't we bring them in here for the briefing? Uh, they don't or work, even here. Better, they don't work here at the White House, the but I would certainly encourage you to reach out to them. John? Sure. Thank you, Sarah. Going back to the <laughs> security clearances, all signs are this is the first time a president personally 
has uh, been handling the removal of security clearances, uh, it's usually been done by superiors. Even in the last two big espionage cases of the Cold War, the Irvin Scarbeck case of 1961 and Felix Block of 1990, the Secretary of State pulled the security clearances of people accused of espionage. Uh, you said the president that others are reviewing it. Who are these others reviewing it, and does the president take a personal role in the potential removal of security clearance? Uh, certainly the president has the constitutional authority to do so. Uh, I know this will come as a shock to you, but I'm not aware of the details of those specific cases that you outlined. Um, but the president has the authority to make that decision. Um, he's also consulting with members of his national security team and uh, members of his legal team here at the White House to make is, those decisions. Uh, one of the, is he also considering uh, a policy of just <laughs> simply having all security passes turned in when someone leaves government service? Uh, I'm not aware of that. As a policy, certainly we would uh, like the ability, if needed, uh, to be able to consult with individuals on national security matters. Um, but they do uh, feel, the team here, that we should look at uh, the security clearance process as a whole. Uh, my understanding is that there are roughly 5 million people that have uh, security clearances here in the United States, and we'd like to take a look at the overall process of who has and who maintains those security clearances. Deborah. Yeah, um, you're right about the president having constitutional authority, as far as I understand, about security clearances as well as pardons. So I guess the question I have is, even though he has that authority, is anybody in the White House thought about putting together boards that would look at security clearances for former um, personnel and pardons as well? Because and the president doesn't seem to be consulting the pardon attorney in the AG's office much. It, is he consulting people? Is he thought of, of, of doing something that would be more transparent, perhaps? Uh, certainly, as the review of the security clearances, my, there is a uh, working group that is looking at the overall uh, security clearance process um, and who maintains those and whether or not those are needed across the board within government. Um, in terms of the pardon process, again, the president has the um, authority to carry out those decisions. He takes input and looks at them on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah, Kristen, on that Sarah, Sarah uh, thank board. you, Sarah. Kristen, um, go ahead. Go, go ahead. Dr. Sorry. On that you said that there are people who are looking at security plans. Can you tell us? Who uh, they there are? are a number of members on the national security team. I'd have to get back to you. I know that uh, the chief of staff is involved in that process. Sarah, yes, sir. thank you. Earlier this week, uh, the president told our colleagues at Reuters that. Can you speak could, up? I'm sorry. Sorry, the president said earlier this week to Reuters that he could run it in reference to the Mueller investigation. What do you mean by that? Uh, the president has. Um, said many times that he's chosen to remain uninvolved uh, in this process, and that's where we are right now. Is that an indication further? that he's thinking about taking some type of action against Special Counsel Robert Mueller, like revoking his security clearances? Uh, I'm not aware of any conversation around that. Sir, Sir? Is, is, it, is it an indication that the President sees himself as above the law? Not at all. Raquel, go ahead. Hi, thank you, Sarah, very much. Some legal experts and lawmakers are saying that President is corrupt and that uh, that are ground for an impeachment case. Is the White House concerned about that uh, that could have an effect in the, in the elections, the midterm elections, and also, does the White House take these allegations seriously? Uh, certainly we take allegations seriously. Uh, the idea of an impeachment is, uh, frankly, a sad attempt by Democrats. It's the only message they seem to have going into the midterms. And I think it's another great reminder of why Americans uh, should support other like-minded candidates like the president that are actually focused on continuing to grow the economy, continuing to secure our borders, continuing to focus on the safety and security of all Americans. Uh, I think that the biggest contrast you could possibly make is the message of the Democrats, which is nothing more than attacking the president and looking at uh, cheap political stunts while this White House and uh, Republicans in the House and Senate are focused on actually doing good things for the American people. Sarah. 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 Amen. Thank you, Sarah. Earlier this week, the President had some tough words of criticism for Jay Powell, the Federal Reserve Chairman. Uh, can you tell us when the last time the President and Powell uh, met face to face and whether or not the President brought up that criticism? with Powell directly? Uh, I believe the last time they met, I'd have to double check, uh, was uh, right around the time that uh, 
that uh, Jerome Powell took his place on the Federal Reserve Board. So has he spoken to him directly about his concerns about raising interest rates? Uh, I'm not aware that they've spoken about that at all. And One last question. Sorry, go ahead, Emily. Thank, thank you, Sarah. On Venezuela, is the president involved, planning on getting involved there at all? There's millions fleeing the country now. What is the U.S. stance on Venezuela at this point? Uh, the United States continues to support uh, Venezuela's neighbors and provide emergency aid and shelter to Venezuela and also continues to stand with the people of Venezuela. Um, and we're going to keep all options on the table and we'll keep you posted if we have any further announcements. Sure, Thank you so much. And we're going to wrap up here so that we can all join the president in the Medal of Honor ceremony. Thanks, Deb. Good to see you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to The Briefing Room. I'm ABC News political director Rick Klein and we have a powerhouse team here in Washington and also in New York. We'll be joined by Cecilia Vega, our White House correspondent, Ali Rogan on Capitol Hill and also Tom Yamas in New York to unpack some of the most consequential events of the Trump presidency all taking place uh, inside the last 24 hours. And I want to start with the president's first reaction, uh, first substantive reaction to the news that Michael Cohen, his longtime uh, attorney and uh, political fixer, uh, pleaded guilty to several federal charges in court and implicated him in some potential wrongdoing. Uh, the president speaking to Fox News earlier today. They weren't taken out of campaign finance. That's a big thing. That's a much bigger thing. Did they come out of the campaign? They didn't come out of the campaign. They came from me and I tweeted about it. You know, I put, I don't know if you know, but I tweeted uh, about the payments, but they didn't come out of campaign. In fact, my first question when I heard about it was, did they come out of the campaign? Because that could be a little dicey. There is so much to, to unpack in that uh, in that interview clip. Uh, Pierre Thomas covers the Justice Department for us. How does this square with the reality of the law? Is the president in the clear if he simply cut the check and never reported it in any way? Well, one thing is clear that in the guilty plea from Michael Cohen yesterday, the Justice Department, specifically the Southern District of New York, held that what Michael Cohen did was a violation of the law. They allowed him to plead guilty to two counts involving campaign finance violations. And in their mind, the hush money payments uh, were used as a method of maintaining the viability to help the campaign to affect the election. And therefore, they're saying that's a violation of the law. Uh, I want to turn to Tom Yamas, uh, joining us from New York, um, who's been covering this issue in the Trump campaign for, for a long time. This is the latest explanation from the White House, from the president, uh, and, uh, and critical, I think, in that quote is him saying that he knew about the payment after the fact. Of course, the tape that Michael Cohen uh, ha has put out publicly uh, shows the two of them talking about that payment before the fact, Tom. This, is, this just seems like it doesn't square. Yeah, there's no doubt the president has, has not been truthful on a lot of aspects of, of these payments and, and what happened with those two women. That much we know. And we should also state that yesterday, Michael Cohen was in court, he was under oath, and he told the judge that he did all of this at the direction of the candidate. We know that candidate was Donald J. Trump. And also something else from the transcript that we have now from when Michael Cohen was, was appearing before that judge. After he testified to all of this, the judge asked, uh, Michael Cohen. He says, did you know what you were doing was wrong and illegal? Michael Cohen says, yes, your honor. Michael Cohen was the president's personal attorney. He knew this was illegal. Of course, the president, I, I shouldn't say of course, it's likely, it's hard to imagine the president didn't know this was illegal, especially if his uh, attorney understood that. And, and he had these recordings where, where, Rick, when you hear these recordings, they were sort of talking uh, in code. They're talking about no cash payments, a check. And when you go through some of the evidence that the FBI recovered, you know, they actually have the contract that, that Michael Cohen established with, with AMI to bury the Karen McDougal story. The FBI has that contract. It was ripped up. It actually never went into effect, but they have a copy of the contract of what the, the arrangement was going to be. And then, of course, you have that, that phone conversation that we talked about, and then both Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal speaking to investigators. So there's a mountain of evidence, but I think the bigger question for both you, Pierre, and everybody else who's working this story, myself, of course, maybe even Dan Abrams, is will the Justice Department now go after the president? And that's the big question. Uh, I want to get to that because uh, Cecilia Vega joining us from the White House. You heard a key defense, uh, if you want to call it that, from the White House is that the president hasn't been charged with any crime, hasn't been accused formally of any crime. Of course, the White House position is that he can't be. And beyond that, Cecilia, you asked directly Sarah Sanders about this apparent contradiction. The president on tape 
uh, talking to Michael Cohen about the payment, now saying publicly that today that he only knew about the payment after the fact. Um, Sarah Sanders called that a ridiculous accusation, uh, uh, Cecilia, but it's, it's pretty clear he, he's contradicting himself. You can call it a lie, you can call it a misspeak, you can call it a mistruth. I mean, clearly it wasn't factual and it certainly hasn't played out, the evidence hasn't played out to show uh, that. Look, the president told the world, we all remember that video because it was so astounding at the time that he knew nothing about the payments to Stormy Daniels and then weeks later ended up admitting that uh, through his attorney and then himself on Twitter that in fact he paid uh, Michael Cohen out of his own pocket and and now the defense seems to be uh, that that wasn't wrong uh, so to for Sarah Sanders to say the word she used back to me was it was a ridiculous question to have asked whether the president has lied to the American people uh, I think is is probably not going to sit very well with a lot of people because um, the facts just don't bear out in this case and Pierre, uh, what, what does it mean to have Michael Cohen cooperating? It's a question that Tom uh, uh, is keying in on. Does it mean that there is a further inquiry? Do we know that for a fact? What could they be doing now with the information that Michael Cohen put forward, even setting aside the, the Manafort guilty, uh, guilty charge? Well, cooperation was not a part of the uh, guilty plea yesterday. But his lawyer is saying he's ready to talk. His lawyer is saying he's ready to talk. And, and, and we may be talking semantics here. Clearly, uh, at some point, the federal prosecutors are likely to sit down with Michael Cohen again uh, as they continue to corroborate his information. And, and one of the critical things that Tom just mentioned is that there are other parties involved here. Uh, the, the people with AMI, uh, the owners of the National Enquirer. You're going to want to know, well, who was involved in uh, writing up that contract? What con uh, kind of conversations uh, were there? Uh, is there documentation of the conversation? Uh, were there other people in the Trump campaign that were aware uh, of uh, these communications? And, of course, what does Michael Cohen have and others that would document what the president knew and when he knew it? Classic question. Perry Bacon joining us here from 538. Welcome to the briefing room. Your Thank debut you. here. Uh, Perry, th this has been just a mind-boggling 24 hours. The, 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 you and I were, were talking about how, how many things were happening all at once yesterday, and now to see the White House responding. Is sense that they are still stabilizing themselves after this really unsettled period? The one thing she kept saying was that there have been no charges filed against the president. That's a very narrow explanation. It's also a very limiting one in the fact that my assumption, and I actually should ask Pierre this, is that DOJ's general guidance is we can't indict the president. So the idea that there are no charges against him is, you know, of course there aren't. That's right. obvious. So if that's the that, so they've moved to a very very thin talking point at this point. And Cecilia Vega at the White House, what is the mood over there? Is, is, are, are people shell-shocked? Are they used to the pace of things that are coming out? Is this registered on, on a, some kind of a political Richter scale that, uh, that other things haven't? You guys could sense just the change in tone from Sarah Sanders during that briefing. Uh, other reporters, I certainly had commented on it. Other reporters who were sitting behind me were audibly commenting on it. Uh, one person I overheard said that she seemed sad. I certainly... Uh, I sensed that this is not something that she wanted to do. Uh, look, and that's a tough job. This, is a th th this was not the easiest day to be the White House press secretary. This uh, sources, uh, we know from talking to sources, they had a really hard time yesterday. The Trump legal team, the White House, the Trump camp coming up with a response. How do you spin something that is almost impossible to spin? Uh, I know from talking with other sources that the president himself is frustrated, that behind closed doors he is still insistent. He is not a part of either of these cases. He did nothing wrong. He, there was no obstruction. So publicly what you see is what you're getting behind the scenes with the exception of this sense of, um, I, I think, just confusion and how to even go about responding to this, this complete chaos that they're in. I've covered Many, many chaotic moments uh, covering this White House. Uh, yesterday was perhaps the most frenetic of them all. All right, we're setting a record on, on that front. And, and Rick, one thing I would add, you notice that the prosecutors yesterday in the Southern District of New York took no questions. They said what they had to say. At this point, they don't want the public to know whether they're investigating the president himself directly or not. And they're going to let this case unfold. Uh, and they're going to do it behind the scenes. And But suffice it to say, what typically happens, if you have a witness or someone who pleads guilty, who makes an allegation of a crime, 
they look into it <laughs> to figure out what the heck happened. And Tom Yamas, I want to I want to get you on this before we move on because uh, you've you've covered Michael Cohen, know Michael Cohen. You were out there yesterday as he was uh, uh, going going into it and, and out of court. Do you get a sense of of what specifically he is eager to share beyond what we know already? We've heard a lot of threats from him and from his attorney Lanny Davis about what he knows and his eagerness to talk. Are there specific things that even go beyond this that he might be prepared to share? You know, Rick, it's incredible how Michael Cohen has melted under this legal pressure. The first time I came to know Michael Cohen, someone told me, you know, uh, Michael's family, essentially saying he's, he's like the Trump mm -hmm. children almost. He's so close to the president. And then to see him yesterday, I had a chance to sort of run out of the press pen and, and shout a question at him. You know, M Michael, do you have anything to say to the president? And he just kind of looked at me, kind of looked through me. And, and to see this person who was always so confident, really, you know, we, we, we say he was the fixer, but he was really the bulldog, too, for the president, or, or Rottweiler is probably a better sense, because he would go out and attack reporters and threaten reporters and then go out on CNN and trash any, any journalist who, who was writing stories critical of the president or reporting on them. To see this person now to completely flip there in court was pretty astonishing. And to Pierre's point... Um, you know, Trump supporters are probably hoping this is this is the beginning of the end. But if you look at some of the facts in this case, it, it might be the end of just the beginning. There, there's a statement here. They have evidence that in August of 2015, Rick, right when this campaign was just getting started, AMI, the publisher, likely David Pecker, uh, because they don't they don't state him there directly. They just said he was the head of this company. AMI comes to Michael Cohen and says, we have to put together a plan to make sure are there are any bad stories, we have to bury them. This is in August of 2015. So just that fact alone tells you the planning behind burying some of these stories. And this is something, again, I want to reiterate, this is something that Michael Cohen um, testified to under oath, and he's a lawyer. So you could call him a liar all you want, but he said this yesterday under oath. And Rick, just going back to that point, you have multiple people potentially involved in these conversations. So it's likely that whatever case they build, or even if they simply want to understand what happened, it's going to involve getting testimony from multiple people. And those people are going to have to make a choice as to whether you know, they're going to be forthcoming or not. And they may say, look, nothing happened, that Michael Cohen has this all wrong. But trust me, when the FBI shows up, or if you get a grand jury subpoena, that's a lot of pressure. And speaking of multiple people, we were struck, Perry, by the conversation you and some colleagues at 538 were having, trying to rank the biggest threats to Trump at this moment. Is it the Manafort? Uh, is it Manafort? Is it Cohen? Is it something that Mueller's doing? What's your sense of how all of this is, is stacking up and ranking? I mean, I, I, th I thought last week the Omarosa video was probably, the <laughs> idea of Omarosa had something to tape right. was like really problematic, but compared to these two things, Michael Cohen has been with Trump for so long on the campaign before that, knows so much. Manafort seems like a little less dangerous only because at this point, you know, he's been convicted. He doesn't seem like he's going to quote unquote flip. He doesn't seem like he's, you know, going to criticize the president. So I think Cohen is a really big sort of, you know, nuclear threat on someone of this presidency, I would say. Pierre, before we let you go, do you agree? Um, look, I think all these things until we get the full Mueller report. And the one thing we know, in this town of leaks, Bob Mueller's office has not been leaking anything. And no. we know a lot, he knows a lot more than we do to be determined. All right, Pierre Thomas, we'll let you get back to the beat. Appreciate you being with us here. Uh, I want to move on to a piece of political fallout from this. Uh, the Democrats on Capitol Hill are using this as a, uh, as a new rallying cry to say that they want to delay the, the confirmation hearings for Brett Kavanaugh. Ali Rogan has been talking to some folks on Capitol Hill. Uh, it does seem like it's a trend. Uh, a lot of folks are keying in on, uh, on, on the facts yesterday and uh, starting to, to use a new term to describe the president. Yeah, Rick, they're definitely sort of zeroing in on this new strategy that seems to be very uh, practiced and something that they've all decided this is the way they're going to go. The Democrats are sort of layering on to their previous arguments, saying that Judge Brett Kavanaugh should release all of his documents, including those that uh, are currently not slated to be released, including uh, documents that were part of his tenure as White House Staff Secretary under George Bush. Uh, Democrats are now saying that the fact that the president is accused in this uh, complaint by Michael Cohen as being the person who directed him to make these campaign violations, the campaign finance violations, that it simply underscores the fact that the Senate needs more time and more documents to be able to fully consider this judge. Uh, there are a couple of other Senate Democrats who are saying that we should simply not consider any justice that the president's trying to get on the bench. Uh, any president who is 
uh, an unindicted co-conspirator in this case, as in the, uh, the Cohen plea agreement. Uh, but in terms of the effect that this is going to have, Rick, I think you and I both well know anybody who observes the Senate up here knows that as long as uh, the Senate Republicans have power, there's not a whole lot Democrats can do to really gum up the works other than make these public statements, because frankly, Republicans can do this mostly without Democrats. Sarah Sanders, uh, in, in, to that point, calling it a desperate and pathetic attempt. Perry, is she right, or is there any chance that, uh, I should frame it to say, any chance that, that the Democrats succeed with this? They haven't got much traction so far in Kavanaugh. In terms of Kavanaugh, the most important thing that happened yesterday was he met with Susan Collins, and afterwards she emerged and said, I believe that he thinks Roe is settled law. We can debate whether he, whether he actually believes that, because Chuck Schumer says he says something different. That said, you know, the Republicans have the votes and the Democrats are talking about delay. This is one of those places where there's a Mitch McConnell Republican Party and the Donald Trump Republican <laughs> Party. And Mitch McConnell wants to get this nominee pet through the Senate. I don't think he really cares about what happened yesterday. Yeah, they'll put their blinders on and as long as they've got those 50 votes, 51 votes, right. they'll be they'll be okay. I, I want to turn to a topic that Sarah Sanders mentioned at the top of the briefing today and it's got a big p possible political implications, but it is a pure tragedy. The story of Molly Tibbetts, a word coming out yesterday, her body being found after an extensive search and apparent Apparently, the man accused of the of the murder is an undocumented immigrant. It is fueling the immigration debate anew. Uh, Tom Yamas, uh, you, you covered all of those Trump rallies, and you remember when Trump would jump on the news uh, of undocumented immigrants uh, committing crimes and championing those causes. You get the sense that maybe in another news environment this might break through more, but this actually has the potential to, to fuel some arguments from the president on down on an issue that they, they feel like they're on the right side of, on the Republican Party side. Yeah, such a strange news environment, too, right, Rick? You have a family uh, whose daughter was in Iowa going to college. She was found dead. And it, it's been less than 24 hours since they've even had that news conference. And, and we're already talking about the politics of this, and partly because President Trump has already made this a political issue. And if anyone thinks that, that he's not afraid to politicize this, he did it for, for nearly two years in the campaign trail. He stood on stage with the parents of, of, of uh, people who had lost their children to, to the violence of undocumented immigrants. And, and he made sure those stories were told. Now, you know, he, he had a major hiccup. Uh, w with what happened on the border, separating those children from their families, his own wife, his daughter, telling them, essentially telling them that that policy was wrong from reports, and then and then having to reverse this and trying to reunite all those children with their parents. Immigration is still such a, a, a huge topic with conservatives, with Republicans. It's something that Republicans want to run on, being tough on immigration. All the candidates that we've seen during this midterm cycle that are aligning themselves with the president are aligning themselves with immigration, including build that wall, with maybe the exception uh, down in South Florida with Carlos Cubello. But, but the rest of the Republicans that are aligning themselves, they are still running on immigration. Uh, and, and something like Molly Tibbetts, it, it is so sad that, that this has just happened, and yet now this is going to be used as a political tool by politicians all across the country to, to campaign on and, and to say we need tougher immigration laws. And as we close out today, I want to talk about the politics uh, of the day because Tom makes some, some fascinating points and we're 76 days out from the midterms. One thing I'm struck by, uh, Perry, I think both both sides, in a sense, are, are a little bit on their heels on this. You've got uh, very few Republicans who really want to weigh in on what happened yesterday. They've suddenly, they need, as you said, they need more information. They need to hear more before they can make any kind of judgment about Michael Cohen's guilty plea or even the Manafort convictions. Um, on the flip side, a lot of Democrats don't want to be talking about the I word, impeachment. It's Republicans that are bringing that up. You heard Sarah Sanders right. bring it up today. There is, there is a sense to me of, of an unsettled political environment where everyone's kind of figuring out exactly what the issues are going to motivate. The Democrats are trying to talk about Russia without talking about impeachment. That's a hard, it's a hard line, right, where they're saying to say Trump is corrupt, Trump has, you know, hired bad people, and so on, without saying impeachment. We were looking at this, though, at 538. It looks like we analyzed 800 Democratic candidates. We found only 20 of them mention impeachment on their website. 20 out of 20 out of 800. So it's not, so I think Pelosi is basically right when she says we are not campaigning on impeachment. But if I were the Trump White House, I would talk about that because you don't know what happens after the election. But so far, the Democrats have actually been pretty disciplined about not not really in terms of leadership at least. You know, you have Tom Steyer running those ads. But in terms of Democrats on the Hill, very few talk about impeachment. This story may push more of them to have to weigh in one yeah. way or the other. Perry Bacon from 538, a pleasure having you here. Our thanks to the whole team, Tom Yamas, Cecilia Vega, and Ali Rogan. I'm Rick Klein. You can download the ABC News app and catch us here next time on The Briefing Room.